Hello there, you are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with political editor at Wales Online, Ruth Maselski, and Whitehall editor at the Financial Times, Sebastian Payne. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. The Guardian leads on the news that ministers have apologised to rape victims, saying they've been failed by the criminal justice system. On the front of the Manchester Evening News, the damning report on the security failings that proved fatal in the Manchester Arena bombing. That story is also the lead for The Express, which says there were nine missed chances to save 22 lives. One of the scientists behind the Oxford vaccine has called for coronavirus testing in schools to be scrapped, saying it's disruptive. That's on the front of The Telegraph. The Mail reports that lockdown restrictions could end two weeks early if it becomes clearer that the jabs are working. The Metro says that pub landlords could face fines of £1,000 for breaking Covid rules if football fans chant or boo during the England-Scotland game. And the FT reports that the government is to put Channel 4 on a path towards privatisation from as early as next year. Well, joining me tonight, Ruth Masolski and Sebastian Payne to take us through the papers. Good evening to you both. Um, before we delve into the papers, Ruth, I wonder if you can uh, respond to the breaking news that we've had from Mark Draper saying that they've put a, a pause on uh, lifting restrictions in Wales. Yeah, in lots of ways, it's obviously expected. The Delta variant is growing here. Um, cases are at 400, um, four out of the five cases, sorry, that are new here are all the Delta variant. Um, this wasn't an official review week for Wales. This is um, on the back of Boris Johnson's announcement about June 21st. We had another week ahead of our review. And um, that will still happen. But uh, Mark Draper has made it very clear that there is a four-week pause now. Things are expecting, like the rule of six uh, for indoor um, homes is being paused. Um, the number of uh, extended households changing, that's been paused as well. And um, ice rinks, which was one of the things that the Welsh Government were looking at changing this review, also paused. Um, Delta variant is causing lots of concern wherever you are in the UK. Um, it's no different here in Wales. Indeed. Uh, Sebastian, let's delve into the, the Daily Mail, the front page uh, there. Could we be free on July the 5th, an earlier date uh, being suggested? Tell us why. So this is a very interesting examination of the data that we're seeing from the coronavirus vaccines. And what the Daily Mail is suggesting that, in fact, the effectiveness of both the Pfizer and AstraZeneca jab mean that we could actually exit those restrictions on July the 5th. Now, we know that Boris Johnson's always had this two-week gap in there. And some in Whitehall think it's because the Prime Minister always likes to have some good news and wanted to make things look more optimistic. But the Daily Mail splash tomorrow seems to suggest that actually we could be out of things earlier. I'm a little bit sceptical of this because when you look at the modelling done by SAGE and the government's scientific advisors, it's really quite clear that they feel that time is needed to get as many second jabs as possible. Because thanks to the Delta variant of coronavirus, which originated in India, it's quite clear that double jabs are now needed across the whole population as quickly as possible to stop hospitals being overwhelmed, more than necessary deaths and the overwhelming of the health service. So. I think at the moment, it's interesting the Daily Mail is detecting that actually things are going a bit better than expected. But fundamentally, I don't think the government's going to challenge it. And as what Lisa was saying about what's going on in Wales, what we've seen in Scotland too, I think all the, the nations of the UK are following this trajectory of having a month of just putting, you know, sort of, it's taking the foot off the accelerator was the words Boris Johnson used. And I feel like that is going to remain the case. But the thing we should be a little bit thankful for, it's early days though, is that it appears the rate of infection is beginning to slow. And if that continues over the next few days, then it shows the vaccines are working and that we are heading out of this crisis. But, but Ruth, why dangle this earlier date? I mean, it could give people false hope. I mean, it's another... Um, date that will be in people's mind, uppermost in their mind, that might have to be dashed again. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And it was uh, the Prime Minister spokesman told journalists on Monday that while they were going to look at it on, the, on July 5th, he thought it was very unlikely that um, we would there would be any changes for England, um, specifically Wales and Scotland obviously doing their own thing. Um, the, the, the June 21st date was very much in England's mind. Mark Draper has been clear for months now that that wasn't going to be the case here in Wales. 
we just haven't had that date. They have routinely said it's data, not dates. And it's interesting that Boris Johnson has um, started hammering that point home a little more um, frequently uh, once it looked like the June 21st date wasn't going to be met. July 5th is is still, you know, it's still very, um, it's not far away. We still don't know. All the, all the signs are good about Delta variant, but we still don't know, you know, and I think any dangling of dates just gets people's hopes up and it just makes you think, well, I can have my wedding, my christening, my my birthday party, and actually still may not happen. Um, so th I think the caution that Wales has shown on dates, I think Mr Johnson maybe needs to um, set an echo from Westminster. Yeah, I mean, it does seem all, almost cruel if, if uh, the, the dates don't uh, materialise. Let's move on to the Yorkshire Post, Sebastian, um, and this the, the the new line that over 18s can book their first COVID jab uh, from tomorrow. Yes, and this shows the progress the vaccination programme is making across the country here, that obviously the government wants to get a single jab in everyone by July the 19th, when that next stage of easing is meant to go ahead. But of course, the real question after this is, what's going to happen to teenagers? That we've seen that some of the jabs have been approved for um, 12 to 18-year-olds, the Pfizer jab in particular, but the JCVI, which is the independent committee that oversees vaccination, they've not given the go-ahead yet for teenagers to get vaccinated. But I imagine that's exactly what's going to happen in August, because we could find ourselves in a situation when that final easing does take place on July the 19th. And I think really, when you look at what Boris Johnson said, what Michael Gove said, everybody wants that to happen. They don't want this thing to drag on any longer. And the fact is, we are going to have a third wave of coronavirus and the hope and there's there's no way of getting around that but the hope is that the vaccinations provide a wall of immunity that means the deaths and the infections and the serious illnesses are far lower than they were um, in the first two waves but i think teenagers are quite crucial for when schools go back in september and we've seen in america too the pfizer jab has been authorized for teenagers so 18 year olds they will get jabbed, and then the question really is what comes next? And the other thing we should note as well is if you look at those who are getting seriously ill from coronavirus at the moment, it's younger people. It's Hospitals are full of those younger people. So that's why the government's clearly moving forward, because that's all part of the plan to double jab and then single jab everybody as quickly as possible. Yes, and I suppose, Ruth, lots of um, over-18s will be rushing to get the, the first jab, um, so perhaps they can get the second in time to, to go on holiday because what they're complaining of now is they're going to be discriminated against because they might not be able to, to go on holiday to amber list countries without quarantining on the way back. I think COVID's had an effect on everyone, hasn't it? It doesn't matter who you are or what your circumstances are, COVID's impacted you. But you can see why young people might think, hang on, I've put my university on hold or... I didn't get my degree ceremony or I didn't get to, you know, leave school in the way that other people did. Um, they, they rightly feel that a lot of their formative years have been taken away from them. And I, and I fully sympathise with them, as with lots of other people um, and different ages. Um, here in Wales, 18 year olds are already being jabbed. Um, our current rate is 67.5%. Um, and that can only be good news. You know, we, we need these young people to be jabbed so that, like Sebastian says, the hospitals aren't full of younger people. It's why both governments um, have said this week that they're delaying things because they want to get those vaccination numbers up. Um, Mark Drapeford's statement tonight, when he's putting these measures on pause, has said that there's going to be half a million um, ex, you know, jabs put out within that period to, to really build up as much immunity as possible. Um, and with cases going up here, Delta variant cases going up here by 184 since Monday, you can completely see why every one of those jabs is absolutely vital. Um, young people are, are no different. They want their jabs, they want their freedoms back, and, and we can't blame them for that, I don't think. Indeed, indeed. Ruth and Sebastian, for the minute, thank you. Coming up, the missed chances. What went wrong the day of the Manchester bombing at the cost of the lives of 22 innocent people? Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, the political editor from Wales Online, Ruth Nasalski, and Whitehall editor at the Financial Times, Sebastian Payne. Welcome back to both of you. Um, let's have a look at the Telegraph, um, Ruth, and the uh, politics of the DUP. Their leader has now quit after only three weeks in the job. Yeah, it's been another busy day in North Ireland. I think each time I've sort of seen the news today, the, the story has changed. Um, he's only officially been leader for 21 days. Um, there was a big internal party backlash about uh, a, a deal done about the Irish language. 
Um, Brandon Lewis announced that this morning, um, which committed that the British government was going to um, intervene if the Stormont Assembly failed to do so by the end of September. Um, but some within Mr Poots' party thought the deal gave too much to Sinn Féin. Um, and throughout the night, there was a, there was a meeting, uh, various people going in, coming out, being box popped by um, our colleagues in Northern Ireland. And it's not been announced that he's resigned. Um, it not only throws, obviously, that deal on the Irish language into um, into question, but it opens up the possibility of a snap election in Northern Ireland. Um, and as your correspondent described earlier, it puts the DUP themselves into free fall. Um, it's a huge, huge story that's got so many different chapters and so many different questions. Um, and the BBC, of, um, BBC James McCormack has said tonight that even by recent standards, it's been a remarkable 24 hours. Um, and I don't think anyone can argue with her there. Uh, Sebastian, and what are your thoughts as to who will uh, replace Mr Poots? Well, it's been one of the most traumatic um, 24 hours in Northern Irish politics, which even by the standards of the rest of the UK has manages to be the most complex and the most vicious. Um, Mr Poots has been leader for 20 days, the DUP, and he was very instrumental in ousting Arlene Foster, who was the previous DUP leader and was also First Minister of Northern Ireland. And fundamentally, there's been a dispute about this Irish Language Act, which Sinn Féin see as absolutely crucial um, to um, to going back into government with the DUP. That proved too much for Mr Poots's colleagues. And so they went straight from voting against his choice of first minister to voting against him. And he's now out. So we'll have yet another DUP leadership election. And the person who's most likely to replace him is Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. He was his contender, his challenger for the leadership. And Poots beat him by just one vote. You imagine that's where the action's going to be now. But fundamentally, this is a very dangerous place for and um, politics in Northern Ireland to be because this all came about because the tensions resulting from Brexit and the fact that this, the Northern Ireland protocol has created deep deep unhappiness within the unionist community. There's no clear resolution to this. And yes, maybe Geoffrey Donaldson becomes the next DUP leader, but how's he going to do a deal with Sinn Féin with or without the Irish Language Act? If he can't do that deal, then you could see the whole administration collapse, pour into another set of elections, and we'll be back to the same old stalemate we've seen for quite some time. And it's just add the DUP's under intense political pressure on its right flank. It's got the traditional Ulster Voice Party, which is pushing it into a more hardline direction. And then on the left, you've got this traditional UUP, which are the Ulster Unionist Party. And the fact is, the DUP is really trapped between these two forces. And Arlene Foster was a general moderate in these senses and trying to balance both of those. Mr. Yes, Poots and, and went she's, in a, she's tweeted, she's tweeted earlier today saying that she was um, having a, a great time, a bit of a, a smirk on her face, I, I think you could imagine. Let's have a look at the Metro and the inquiry into the Manchester Arena bombing and their headline then saying he should have been spotted, that a baby should have been spotted. Many failings being pointed out, Ruth. Yeah, I mean, you can't help but read this report and just feel feel sorry for everyone involved. You know, the, the, the families have been through so much already and now to hear that there were these chances formally um, must just be heartbreaking. But I think it's credit to them in the interviews I've seen with them um, since this report came out that they're working for change. They want to see things um, made better. They want to see this not happen again and no one else go through it and that means sitting through these painful reports which there's going to be three um and learning those lessons and, and and hearing what what did go wrong i mean there's things of police um officers going five miles for a kebab on the night there's pictures of the four british transport police um officers who were on duty in the um further away in the train station rather than in the foyer where they should have been there's the the evidence of the member of the public who who saw the bomber and and, and tipped off a security guard only for his walkie-talkie not to work. You know, there's 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 really damning um, and really sad um, uh, parts of this report that are coming out. Um, hindsight is a brilliant thing, um, but we've all had to live, unfortunately, with um, life with uh, terror events uh, in recent years. Uh, thankfully, touch wood, they've, they've eased, obviously, given um, current circumstances. But we are going to get back to that world, and people need to know that they can um, go about their, their lives and go to things like gigs and large venues and feel safe um there's there's the, it just sounds like there's going to be an awful lot more details coming out that for these families that is going to be absolutely horrific and heartbreaking and you can only hope they keep the dignity that they've been showing today yeah as you say ruth uh, painful for the uh, victims and their families